The honorary degree will now be conferred. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Sam Black to present the honorary degree candidate, Dr. Yosef Wusk. Dr. Black is an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy and the former editor of the Canadian Journal of Philosophy, as well as being former vice chair of the Senate. Dr. Black. Madam Chancellor, at the center of Joseph Wass' work is the ideal of making a life surrounded by beauty, truth, and erudition more accessible. A pioneer in continuing education and a visionary philanthropist, Dr. Wask has, by his leadership, made a permanent contribution to the cause of lifelong learning. While completing two bachelor's, two master's, and two doctorate degrees from universities including Harvard, Boston, Yeshiva, and the University of British Columbia, he embarked on his life's work of nourishing the minds of others. He became director of interdisciplinary programs in continuing studies at Simon Fraser University, where he served for more than 15 years, and where he remains an adjunct professor in the Department of Humanities. During this period, he developed a variety of strikingly innovative programs, such as the Philosopher's Cafe, and the Canadian Academy of Independent Scholars that significantly enhance opportunities for reflection and debate in our community. The Philosopher's Cafe alone has attracted more than 70,000 people throughout BC. A prolific author, Dr. Wask has also touched many lives with more than 100 published articles. An active member of many boards, Dr. Wass resembles the re Renaissance statement Lorenzo de' Medici in his commitment to making the true and the beautiful available to all. A passionate educator who has taught thousands of students and championed dozens of schools, he has contributed to a stunning variety of artistic, intellectual, and spiritual causes. In BC, he has generously donated to many libraries and archives including the SFU and Vancouver Public Libraries. He remark remarkably, he has initiated and funded more than 400 libraries throughout the world. A major collector himself, he has also contributed to museums on all seven continents. He supports numerous foundations dedicated to preserving architectural inheritance, including the Vancouver Heritage Foundation. His support for public gardens ranges from community parks to developing a 100,000 tree peace forest near Jerusalem and a roof garden for the Vancouver Public Library. He is equally an intellectual leader among patrons of the arts, having endowed both the Vancouver Poet Laureate and the British Columbia Creative Achievement Award for Applied Art and Design, as well as being a founding donor of the Dance Center in Vancouver. An ordained rabbi, Dr. Wask is devoted to cultivating the human spirit and has sat on councils with ministers of diverse religions. In recognition, he was awarded a Martin Luther King Jr. Award for exemplary community service. Described as one of the province's leading public intellectuals, Yosef Wask is a member of the Order of British Columbia and recipient of the City of Vancouver Mayor's Arts Award, an Outstanding Achievement Award from the Canadian Museums Association, and a Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for his exceptional contributions to Canadian culture and heritage. Madame Chancellor, on behalf of the Senate of this university, I ask that you now confer upon Josef Wask, a man who thoroughly embodies the Renaissance ideal of personal cultivation expressed in magnificent public philanthropy, the degree of Doctor of Letters Honoris Causa.
Yosef Wask, by virtue of the authority vested in me and in the Senate of this university, I hereby admit you to the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa. Dr. Wask will be hooded by Dr. John Driver, Vice President Academic, and Dr. Kate Ross, Registrar. Your speech. It is with great pleasure that I now call on Dr. Josef Wask for his convocation address. Dr. Wask. I dedicate these words to Milton Wong, one of the kindest men this world has ever known, to my father, Morris J. Wask, who encouraged and supported me throughout my life, and to Jack Blaney, former president of this university and mentor extraordinaire. Who knows what I'm going to speak about today? That was the question that Nazardan, the Sufi mullah, asked as he prepared to deliver a sermon in the packed village mosque, to which the people, surprised, answered, no, no, of course we don't. To which Nazardan replied, well, I refuse to waste my time on a bunch of ignoramuses like you, and he left. <laughs> the next day, he was invited back. Who knows what I'm going to speak about today? This time, the people afraid to lose him answered, I do, we do, to which he said, if you already know, then I'm not going to waste my time repeating myself, and once again, he left. Even though the people were perplexed, they invited him back for the third day, and as he mounted the pulpit, he asked, who knows what I'm going to speak about today? This time, the people had a plan, so half answered, I do, we do, and the other half answered, no, no, of course we don't. To which Nasruddin replied, good, let those who know tell those who don't. And with that, he left. <laughs> Madam Chancellor, President Petter, faculty, staff, family, friends, and especially graduates. I'm going to speak about what I have learned, presented as some hard-earned advice in the guise of five surprising blessings and a dare. I will give only headlines, speak in exaggerated terms, enthuse you to live your life with a kind of soulful brilliance, and trust that a hint is sufficient for the wise. The five blessings. Today, I advocate that you all become beggars, thieves, fools, arrogant, and masters of destruction. I realize that these may be rather shocking offerings, but here they are. Beggars. Beggars are not just the poor and downtrodden, but also holy beggars, those who realize how inconsequential they really are compared to the fullness of the universe. 
They may be professional beggars who claim a corner or itinerant beggars who wander the world. Constantly humbled, forever in exile, they experience the essential nature of life. But they too are constantly giving. This is what I've learned from beggars, that we are each other in disguise. I've learned how to ask and how to receive, how to beg for knowledge, love, and life, because there are so many things that we just cannot accomplish alone. It is those humble ones that I refer to when I wish we could all become like them and share a meal at the beggar's banquet to come. Thieves, I trust that this graduating class will be the most honest and ethical. And yet, to truly succeed in your studies, you must also learn from thieves who are always looking to profit from what is not yet theirs. This applies, of course, only to learning. It is a category referred to as kinat sofrim, jealousy of the scholars. For when you see someone of greater learning or accomplishment, you may desire to be like them. Not everything can be transmitted from teacher to student. Some things must be seized by the student alone. Listen how the Taoist teacher, Sathon, explains it. I tell my students, the best mode of learning is to pretend you are a thief. If you come with a sense of entitlement because you've paid for the lesson, you will be passive. You can wait for 10 years and say, how come you didn't show me that? And I can say, I have been showing it to you all this time, but you haven't been skillful enough to steal it from me. Fools. I wish that you become not only domesticated and highly trained scholars, but that you also embrace the crazy wisdom of those who live life large, those who are intoxicated with ideas and eager to see them realized. To accomplish this, you sometimes need to play the fool, to stand on your head, to see things upside down and sideways inside out and from a distance. If you are fortunate, you may slip into a state of mystical union where the knower, the knowledge, and the known are one. Being a fool is when you can devote yourself wholeheartedly to achieving a worthwhile goal. You are meshuga le davar echad, crazy for one thing. Yet the fool does not just live a life defined by hard-edged results. His path is paved with poetry and filled with humor. Her story is garbed in spontaneity, garlanded with bells and electrified by an infinity of alternatives. Arrogant. The fourth blessing is that you proclaim your arrogance and not just your humility. Everyone has two pockets. One carries the egotistical attitude of me and mine, of bishvili nivraha olam, the entire world was created just for me. The other pocket balances the first. It carries the attitude of feeling insignificant, of I am dust and ashes. There are times when the first pocket, that of arrogance, is called for. It is an intense experience, often accompanied by thanksgiving, that can strengthen your thoughts and transform your visions. It can also save your life, as it did Buckminster Fuller's when he was a young man and depressed by a series of disappointments. A second before suicide, he heard a voice urging him instead to embark on an experiment to find what a single individual can contribute to changing the world and benefiting all humanity. That humble man was saved by an outburst of arrogance and became one of the most original thinkers of the past hundred years. May confidence be your ally and a reminder that you are exceptional and a type of genius in your own right, that you have a gift like no other to benefit the world. If you still insist on belittling yourself, hiding in the pocket of distorted humility, then pay attention to this ancient story 
of just how much the life force demands our growth. I'll call Esav the Esav, Yesh Lecha Malach Sha'omed Alav. Over every blade of grass, there is an angel that hovers above it, Umakel Biyado, with a stick in its hand, Vihikao, and it hits the grass, Vitsoek Alav, and calls out upon it, Gidal, Gidal, grow, grow. Masters of destruction. The last blessing is that you become iconoclasts, breakers of false belief and destroyers of delusions. I'm not referring to violent destruction, but rather to creative destruction that clears the way for renewal. I'm referring to personal beliefs and even to our dreams that can impose their unconscious tyranny over our lives. Our days may be passed in sleepwalking in yearning but never doing. I have learned that to fulfill my dreams, I must wake up. All birth requires prior destruction. The waters that break, the pod that splits, the earth that parts, the shell that shatters. Entire civilizations sometimes need to be defied. My teacher, Harav David Lifshitz, once stopped our class and challenged us. You students, he said, are too impressed with the idea of civilization. During the last war, who was the most civilized of all nations? The Nazis emerged from a culture of composers and philosophers, of authors and scientists, and yet what did they do with it? With one hand, they played the piano, and with the other, they strangled children. That is why I encourage you to become great builders when you can, but dauntless destroyers when necessary. The most difficult subjects are ourselves. The illusions are more complex, for they insulate our sanity. And yet if we don't dispel them, we re remain barricaded prisoners of our own minds. Over the years, I've been fortunate to have teachers who urged me to fling open the gates of perception and not to wait for Kafka's doorkeeper to declare, no one else could ever be admitted here since this gate was meant only for you. I am now going to shut it. 10,000 barriers stand in our way. We will need 10,001 strategies to overcome them to arrive at our destination transformed by our efforts as masters of creative destruction. Today, you are what might be referred to as UAOs, Unidentified Academic Objects. <laughs> Tomorrow, you will pursue your future and consolidate your reputations. It is like kindergarten deja vu. Mastering one level only puts you in kindergarten of the next. The path is long and the journey unyielding. I spent most of my life being lost, climbing, searching, falling, finding, and struggling to arise. I discovered that brains can be awakened no matter our age, and hearts, however closed, can be reinvented that arms, even if passive, can reach out, and that souls, even if wounded, can soar unbound once again. Now you, along with Nasruddin, know what I spoke about today. I urged you to be brazen thieves and holy beggars, inverted fools and arrogant masters of destruction. May you be further incited to live your lives with the passion of lovers and the stamina of athletes to achieve your goals with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And finally, the dare. I conclude with a compelling parable by Apollinaire in which we overhear a dramatic discussion between a teacher and students not just a teacher of facts and fictions, 
but a teacher of life. I have learned that there is no corner of the cosmos where wisdom does not dwell. Guides are everywhere, in the waters and winds, fires and fields. Listen, and they will speak. Come to the edge, he said. We are afraid, they said. Come to the edge, he said. They came, he pushed them, and they flew.